Okay, so the truth is I was brought up on an orchard and I didn't know a lot about engineering, but I was quite practical and interested in uh, fixing things, interested in a career where I could um, uh, use my um, passions in science and maths and things, but also have something practical. So our careers advisor, I went to an all girls school, showed us a video which had this woman uh, and she was on a construction site bossing men around. And I went home that night and said to my parents, that's it, I'm going to be an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for me, look, uh, I, I was, I was um, pretty good at uh, maths and science at school. I enjoyed those. Um, grew up with Meccano, which none of you guys know anything about nowadays. Do you know Meccano? Yeah. I, yeah, I but love it. But it's all the plastic stuff now. No, this it's was real. Copper. This was yeah, me this yeah, was yeah, metal yeah. stuff with yeah. electric motors, a whole lot. Cut your Fantastic. Yeah, and, um, and I wasn't going to be a teacher. And there was a guy who was a bit older, or he's probably about uh, eight or ten years older than me, who I thought was pretty cool. And he was a civil engineer and told good stories. And uh, that was about it, really. Um, I followed uh, this fellow's name, Peter, and just followed what he did. There was nothing more to it than that. Remarkably similar story. I, I was going through school, I got to the age of about, oh, it must have been 14 or 15, hadn't got a clue. I was born and raised on a farm in the southwest of Scotland. And I think like all of us going, going through school, you always have a number of teachers that you look up to and respect. And I had one in particular who was brilliant at rugby and was really my rugby coach, really. So at the end of the day, I respected him <laughs> because of that. And uh, I, I was having a yak to him one day. Mr. Carson's name was Jimmy, Jimmy Carson. I, and I said, what am I going to do? And he says, why don't you be an engineer? And it was as simple as that. <laughs> From that point, I'd never really thought about it until that point. I went home, looked it up, reflected on it, and thought, actually, that sounds pretty good. <coughs> All right. So as I introduce myself, I am the general manager uh, here in New Zealand for uh, the water and waste business unit for MWH New Zealand. So that's how I'd describe it to a CEO. And to someone on the shop floor, what being a general manager, uh, Water and Waste in New Zealand has about 100 people and we are spread over 10 offices. So my responsibility is, as you would expect, it's for the financial results of that unit, it's for the people in those 10 offices, uh, it's for the clients that we service, it's for the delivery and all the internal processes that go with that. For, for me, somehow, every, every time I'm, I'm asked about this, it somehow comes back to the people I'm working with. And, I, and that tends to be what I talk about, really. Um, who, who, who the people are that I work with, uh, how I interact with them, uh, who, who the management team has been, uh, what we're involved with, projects, and so on and so forth. I'm not sure that I ever really have, have sat down and told anyone that this is what I do step by step um, uh, in my job. Um, I did do an assessment, I remember some time ago when I was thinking, now what do I actually spend my time on uh, when I was running the business? And I was quite intrigued with that because I think that I've worked out something like about 40% of my time was spent with our people, about 40% of the time was spent with clients, and it seemed about 20% seemed to be doing what was probably what people think the CEO role was. That, that's pretty much how it's been for me, I guess, uh, all the way through. Mm. And again, I've got a, a, probably a similar answer to Barry. I mean, I, I, look, at, I look at my role and uh, a lot of it does come down to, uh, po unfortunately, uh, because Opus is uh, you know, re reasonably large, uh, we're, we're publicly listed as well. So we've got a lot of politics that come with that. So I, I always boil it down to three things, politics, people and numbers, unfortunately. So I do very, 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 in fact, zero engineering anymore, which is my only real regret in the job that I'm doing. I love the job that I'm doing, but I really miss the the day-to-day -day challenge of working on engineering projects. How would I describe it to a fellow CEO? Well, it's somewhere, somewhere like a cross between, a, a <laughs> I guess, a kindergarten teacher <laughs> and, uh, and perhaps someone that attempts to set strategy for where we're going in the company. Why is it a kindergarten teacher? Well, effectively, it's, about, it's perhaps a, a poor analogy to use, but it really is about trying to get everybody in that room or whatever, whoever you're talking to, all onto the same bus going in the same direction. Simple as that. Um, oh, look, I, I think that's a, a really, really interesting question. We were having a chat just over a cup of tea earlier. I am a, 
passionate, passionate engineer. Even though I've just spent the last two minutes saying I don't do engineering anymore, I'm passionate to say that I am an engineer. Um, when I go through the airport, I could quite easily put on the little forms, when you go through the airports, I could easily put CEO, but all right, engineer, exclamation mark, because I'm incredibly proud of it. What does it bring to me? Well, engineering, uh, it brings a huge uh, cross-section of very generic skills and capabilities that I don't think you can get in virtually any other degree that I can think of. So you get the, the, at the end of a four-year degree course as an engineer, you come out and hopefully you all want to stay within engineering, but what it does do is it gives you the opportunity, for whatever reason, if you don't like it, you can move sideways and go into a different industry. And that, to me, is just one of the... And that is, has always been, and will always be, one of my biggest mantras when I'm talking to anybody is don't specialise too quickly. And engineering allows you to do that. <laughs> for me, it's been about the challenges and the opportunities that I've been given. Just, just enormous opportunities. Um, <coughs> I've spent something like 12 <coughs> years of my career overseas, about nine years in Asia, uh, and about three in the Pacific, something like that. And um, I've always been a always been a bit footloose, you know, a bit sort of um, impatient um, for a number of reasons, and wanting to take on challenges. And the opportunities and challenges that I've been given in um, in uh, engineering have been phenomenal. Uh, opportunities to meet people, some absolutely outstanding people, and work with them. Some projects to do, and, and then um, you know I sat on the executive of, uh, of GHD for um, for a period of time when I when I uh, headed up Asia and was based in Beijing. Just a fantastic experience. I I don't know of any other career that could have given me what I've um, what I've got out of this. Yeah, and I'll echo the sentiments uh, of both David and Barry in that uh, engineering has given me a very varied um, career. I started with MWH, or a predecessor uh, that joined MWH, in Nelson, New Zealand. I spent two years there, and then I decided I wanted to do my OE, like a lot of people. And so I spent 18 months in New Orleans, Louisiana. I spent a year in High Wycombe, England, and I spent two and a half years in Sydney, Australia, all with MWH. So they've allowed in a great variety of roles, doing a great variety of disciplines. Uh, so I've yeah, been able to uh, travel. I've been able to try very diverse areas of our um, business and yeah, really enjoyed the opportunities that engineering has provided me. Um, I can give you, I can turn the question around if you want. What key qualities do you notice young, young engineers which you wish you didn't have at their age? <laughs> <laughs> and that comes back down to the X and Y generation and I think one of the uh, biggest challenges that, that we've got when we're hiring graduates and cadets is, is the fact that uh, uh, because of, of, of the nature of the different society in which they've been brought up and you've, you've learned your art, as such many of them, uh, many of you, when you come and work for Opus or GHD or MWH, you, you, you don't want to do the hard yards unfortunately. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we've got with a lot of our young engineers coming into university and in that they don't want to put the hard yards in. And unfortunately, there is no shortcut to that. You've absolutely got to do that. So I haven't really answered the question, but I think it's probably more of a relevant answer that I'd like to get across to you now. Uh, for me, the, 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 um, I remember uh, lacking confidence when I was a, a graduate. And, and it was a different world, uh, guys, to, to what I see now. You know, my boss sat in an office um, all day and, and the, the mere thought of going along and talking to my boss was um, probably a bit intimidating and if he if he said I want to see you you knew you're in trouble and that's quite different to, to how it is now and uh, uh, like most um, consulting or I suspect construction companies much more um, interaction uh, across that so there's a level of confidence there but I, I um, do also um, there are some things that I think are missing uh, that, that I notice um, you know, I was pulling cars to pieces when I was uh, when I was at university, and, and rebuilding cars, um, uh, painting rooms, um, putting sheds up, and, and I don't know that still happens, and I'm not quite sure. I, I think there's something missing about uh, sort of the hands-on bit, um, and, and the experience just from uh, you know we talked about Meccano, but sort of. Big Meccano, I guess, or, or slightly bigger Meccano in, in terms of that. Some of that's missing. Um, though I, I just make a comment. Uh, when we look at trends, we're talking about bell curves, you know, 
And, and when we talk about generational trends, there's a lot of stuff that sort of says one generation's like this and another's like that. It, I, I actually probably see those a lot more blurred because pe people fit anywhere in that bell curve. It's just the bell curve tends to move a little bit, if you understand what I'm saying there about um, different styles and so forth. But, um, you know, gosh, I wish I had an ounce of your, um, your confidence. Um, uh, but it does need to be tempered uh, with expectations and how you do get ahead. Yep. Yeah, so mine is echoing. It's, it, the first thing that came to mind was definitely confidence. And an illustration was that, again, the, the manager was someone that you didn't disturb an issue absolutely had to. And the first time I had to chair an office meeting, so there was no clients, it was just internal staff, I actually fainted. So, uh, <laughs> true story. How are you feeling alone? Yeah. <laughs> just a little bit nervous. <laughs> uh, but it, it is. It's something that a lot of us didn't have coming out. Was uh, was a lot of confidence, which you see a lot more in the graduates coming out today. Yeah. Um, that's a very, very good question. You've got to do it. Uh, quickly and compassionately is, is the way that I would say. Ev everybody has to make the tough decisions. Ev everybody makes tough decisions all the time. And unfortunately, if you can't make tough decisions, you shouldn't be in that role, quite frankly. But you've got to do it compassionately. It's not just about going in and, and, and making, uh, uh, making a decision. And you, you need to provide context for the decision as well. So I think once you have uh, formed a view or formed an opinion on something that, that needs to be done, I would recommend that you need to go and talk to uh, trusted confidants and anybody who's in a senior position should work towards having custod, uh, trusted confidants, which I do. I've got a couple of people that I can go and talk to and I'll go and talk to them and say, listen, I'm thinking about doing X, Y and Z. And then from that point on, once you get their views, it's really about sticking to the path, but doing it compassionately and doing it quickly. It's probably very much as very similar to uh, what David um, has, has talked about. Um, I think there's a couple of bits that really help you make and implement decisions. The first is uh, having a very clear strategy and uh, set of objectives and goals and plans for what you're trying to achieve. And, and in a business, that's really important. You've got to have that because that tells you exactly what you've got to do. You know, when things come up, that's the framework that says, I need to address this. And, and you talk to people and socialize them, uh, sometimes widely, sometimes uh, quite, quite shortly. So that strategy is really <coughs> important in telling you uh, what you need to do. I think there's something else that's important too, and that's having a very strong values framework uh, and understanding um, the organizational values and your own values. And I can tell you now that um, if your own, and you want to spend time on this while you're doing it now, because your values, you know, it takes time to develop an understanding of what your own values are. <coughs> your own values need to align with the companies or the organizations because if they don't, it's not going to work. So, but what the values do is tell you how to then act on that uh, decision that you need to make. So those two parts, I think, are really important. That clear strategy and framework of objectives and goals and, and actions you're going to take uh, tells you what to do and that clear um, the uh, framework around values tells you how to do it and do it. Get on and do it. Okay, I've got um, just a few other tips that help me. Uh, one is to know your deadline. If it's a tough decision, you need to know how long you've got to make that decision. Obviously, a quicker decision is usually better, but it's good, depending on the decision, to know when that deadline is. It's good to get the appropriate people involved in that decision-making process, and that might be only one other or multiple. The other things that I always think are important is to widen the decision. Quite often we limit it to this or that, or it's either this or it's not. Uh, quite often uh, there's, a, there's a different way of doing it, uh, or there's another alternative that you haven't thought of, so try and widen your options within the time allowed. I mean, if you need a decision today, that's quite different to if you need a decision by, by next week. Uh, reality test it. See, depending again on the de um, decision, uh, you need to get some data to back it to make sure that you're not just biased towards that decision. If there is some appropriate data that you can get, it's always good to have that. Uh, try and attain some distance. Quite often, if you think, what would a friend do? What would my colleague do? 
what would the predecessor have done? Just try and think of it in a different way, because often you're so close to that decision, it's good to try and think about it from a different perspective. And the other, and arguably one of the most important things, be prepared to be wrong. So have a backup plan, okay? Because it doesn't always go your way. Okay, so the one that immediately came to mind uh, for this for me is we have, we have a current client who wrote a letter to me who said uh, that our performance was uh, so terrible on this job that they were thinking of uh, cancelling our contract and giving it to someone else. So clearly, um, it's not good to admit that in front of two of my computers. No, I'm, I'm recorded that. You've you had yeah, one yeah, of those? Yeah, unbelievable. I've never got one no. of those. No. I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> 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 so, I'm interested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could tell. So um, the key thing here and what I wanted to say about leadership is knowing how to react to something like that. First thing I did was uh, get on the phone that day and say that we're very sorry to have received something like that and that they felt necessary to write that and could I come visit them the next day. You know, so got on a plane, get down there. Through the series of that conversation, I found that um, it was actually just a series of in hindsight, humorous misunderstandings that had led to that point. Within that meeting of going through our perspective, their perspective, how this had come to be, uh, it turned right around. And the very next day we had a workshop on that job and they think that we're fantastic. There's no thought of doing it. They've now asked us to do several other jobs because of that. So it all turned around and it was all based on, it was a, a very um, important job for, for that particular client. It was critical to their timelines for some other jobs. And as I say, once you've got through it, and I think the leadership there is knowing how to react. If we had sat on that, or if we'd just written a letter in response, it could have gone very badly. But to just get there in front of them uh, and to talk about it and get those misunderstandings out of the way has worked out for, for both parties. It's a good story, and if I can just add a little bit more to that, Tanya, um, because, because uh, that was facetious about you know, comments uh, that I was making before. Um, and I've told many people this, the, the time where I have seen uh, clients captured for life and where the relationships have really in, gone on and, and endured, on a number of occasions have come out of how an organization or individuals have responded to that, hey, I'm going to fire you guys off this job because you, you haven't delivered. And if you respond in the right way, I can tell you, that, that's, you can capture, you can capture uh, clients for life through that. Uh, I, I don't know if that's, mm, that's, that's okay. my own experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, just just the, uh, talking about this though, one of the things that fascinates me about leadership, ha and I, having worked overseas in, in quite different cultural environments, is the link between leadership style and, and culture, and I, 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 I'm fascinated by that. And it's not only culture that we see in different countries, it's also organizations, uh, because they have, um, organizations have their own cultural style, and it's being able to adapt your leadership style to the environment that you're in, and, that, and I think that's really important to do. And I thought I'd share with you a, a story that came out of uh, when I when I first graduated. I did. Uh, I was telling a couple of people earlier on. Um, I did two years of volunteer service abroad. People know VSA, yeah. volunteer service abroad. I, I'd always want to do VSA, um, and I went to uh, Tonga. Hence, the pa part of the reason. There's other reasons as well why Tonga is sort of so important. I was the engineer of the Outer Islands of Tonga. I was 23 or 24 and I had 80 staff, for heaven's sake, building an airfield on, on a very remote island in Tonga. And, and I can remember that, look, I, I didn't have that background or experience about how to do this. And we got behind program and I started double shifting and we end up, I'll tell you, we end up with a fight on the site, a physical fight, I wasn't involved in it, but, but there, was a, there was a fight on the site. Um, because I was driving and driving to try and get performance out of this and catch up on program. On this island, there was a wonderful old gentleman who died uh, um, shortly after uh, we left, but um, Fine, his name was, and um, he was the government representative. And in Tonga, it takes a long time for the people to get to the stories. You know, they, they always try and find a connection, family connection, and so on and so forth. And um, at, at the peak of all this, I remember uh, he said, come around on a Sunday and, um, and uh, let's have lunch after church. Um, and uh, went around his place. And um, during the afternoon, he asked how the project was going. I started talking about some of the issues we had. He said to me, um, you know, Barry, um, Tonga's a very small place. 
Um, there's only about 100 or 110,000 people in Tonga, um, but actually there's only one of you, and sometimes something's got to change. And, and I've got to say, you know, for me at that time, that was quite, a, quite a, an eye-opener about how to change my leadership style um, to respond to <coughs> something that was going wrong. And observing how Tongan leaders survived and excelled and got things done and then modifying how I did things to suit them. And I think that's something to keep in mind as you go through your career, that, that you have to sort of adapt to your style. Don't forsake your values, because I think you know, within, within that values framework, that, that's, that's fundamental, and that's what you've got to build your, your life on. But um, that style as, as to how you approach issues is so important, and, and how we do things here, and Kiwis socialise things, so the cows come home, I'm not sure if Scotland, how you found it coming here from, from Scotland, but um, crikey, um, that, that style would not work in China, because they would think, no. you, you don't know what you're doing. <coughs> yeah, you know? yeah. You, you, you have to be a leader, you're not decisive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, th yeah, ex exactly that. Look, I mean, um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a little story just l listening to what Bar. I was going to give you another one, but I've, I've decided I'll, I'll change tack slightly. And it's probably a, it's a, probably a slightly negative connotation to this, but I've just been looking at some of the other uh, questions you've got. How do you motivate a demotivated team? How do you make tough decisions? And this little story was, was something that I've reflected on for a while. Uh, and listening to Barry talk about, about about how culture and about how you are as a leader can really seriously influence the, the way that an organization's going. We had a situation, uh, before I was currently in the role uh, that I'm in just now, I was running the uh, UK business, and we've got about you know, 300, 400 people in the UK. And um, at that time, it was in early 2009, and I'm sure most of you remember uh, the GFC, the global financial crisis, everybody? <laughs> yes, we all remember that, yeah. The global financial crisis hit, hit the UK particularly bad, and of course we, Opus in the UK, were not immune to that whatsoever. So I went over there in, in January uh, 2009. Uh, we unfortunately had to make a number of people redundant um, over there, so that's one of the first things that I had to do there uh, when we got there, and we made about 75 people redundant, which in itself was a, a fairly tough thing to do, and it certainly was a fairly tough thing for me to do, having never obviously done that before. But then we kind of went through that period and the people were exited from the business and then we were left with a situation as where all our competitors in the UK, where all the available revenue was just basically gone. And we were looking for every opportunity to save cost. And again, like all of our, uh, all our competitors, we decided that we were going to make the tough decision, previous question, the tough decision that we were going to ask all our staff to take 10% pay cuts, which is a pretty tough thing to do, okay? Pretty tough thing to do. And so we put the context around it, we socialised it, we put the context around it, we explained why we needed to do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, you're effectively asking a staff member to sign a variation to their employment contract. So they actually have to sign a piece of paper and a letter that says, yes, I'm prepared to do this for these reasons. Now, we had an office in, down in Fareham, and there was a group down there of about, uh, about 20 people who all got together and basically said, no, we're not going to do this. We absolutely, solidly refuse. The manager that was down there could not persuade them. He put the context there and he rang me up. And again, I'd only been there for three, for, you know, three or four months. He said, I don't know what to do here. And it was, a, it was a pretty tough situation. And I kind of reflected and I put myself in their position. Exactly what you were just saying there, Barry. I put myself in their position and said, right, if I were them, I'd probably feel a little bit pissed off as well, right? What would I want? Well, I'd want to be able to tell somebody how I feel. That's what I'd like to do. I would like to tell them why I feel like this and let them hear from me. That's what I'd like to do. So if that was, if that was the case, I felt I needed to go down there and have a forum exactly like this, not me standing up the front presenting, but everybody rolling up their sleeves and me listening. And effectively, it was like going into a, the dragon's den with a, with a target painted on my chest. But in that one three or four hour meeting, because that's what it took, we effectively just completely released the tension from everybody in that room to the extent that, you know, we got to the end of it and I said, well, look, if anybody wants to call me a so-and-so, then how about you do it to my face now? Don't do it to my back. And one young lady turned around and said, you absolute, and called me that. And that just completely released the tension. And they all signed their letters by the next day. So uh, what did I learn from that? Well, I guess I learned, which I probably something I didn't say before in terms of... Uh, how do you make the tough decisions? Nine times out of ten, I think, when you're making the tough decisions is go with your gut. 
Go with what you think is right and put yourself in the position of that person that you're making the tough decision to and make sure it's right on them. It's, it's more along the same theme. For me, how do you overcome problematic issues? It's get the people around you that are most going to be able to help and the tools that you need to get that done. And get that as soon as possible. Um, in, you know, the sooner you get onto it, uh, the, the easier it will be to fix. So it is about uh, the people and resources you need to overcome them. What have I learned from past failures? Uh, when I reflected on this, it's patience and perseverance that come to mind. Uh, you, know, you learn the most from failure, it's, it's true, you always do. The, they are the illustrations that, that come back to mind when you, you go through everything. But you just need to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, reflect on what's happened and try it a different way. So. Uh, I, think, I think that's very true. Um, it, one of the things that you'll find through your career is all the problems in one way or another, almost all the problems, I won't say all, but almost all the problems come down to people one way or another. Yep. Now there can be systems issues, they're actually people issues, you know, whether you like it or not. Um, but you know, it, it, that, that's what it comes down to is, 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 and if there's a skill that you need to learn is the ability to listen and understand. And uh, part of that is to build a group around you, as David um, and I think Tanya's mentioned as well, people around you, just small a group who you can trust to talk things and bounce things off, but then uh, the ability to listen and then the ability to act on that. But um, you know, um, you, you do an engineering degree and everything, you come, you come out and you're looking for projects and so on and so forth. And somewhere, not too long after that, you realize it all actually comes down one way or another to people. I probably can't add anything to that, but I, but I couldn't agree more, quite frankly. It's, it's getting the right people in the right roles, full stop full stop and if I've learned anything from the four years I've been doing this job and I've made heaps and heaps and heaps of mistakes is that I haven't made the tough decisions quick enough and in nine times out of ten those tough decisions have been about getting the right people in the right roles. Simple as that. Um, well I remember um, uh, talking, as I said before, Kevin, Kevin Thompson. Have you all, have you all met Kevin? Uh, Kevin Thompson is the pres president of IPENS. He was the pre previous chief executive of Opus for 10 years uh, before I took on board. And I can remember when uh, he was a fantastic uh, mentor, still is uh, to me. Um, and one of the things I can vividly remember him telling me was be yourself. Be yourself in every single situation. Be genuine and be yourself. And I tell that to absolutely everybody. I can remember. Uh, going for the role of chief executive, uh, being going up for the interview, and I was absolutely gobsmacked that I even got asked to, to go for the interview. And I was kind of, really, me? Talking to me? Really? So I ended up going along to this interview, of course, expecting not even to get past the first, the first hurdle. And I can also remember thinking, right, I better start thinking and acting like a chief executive should think and act. And I started to try and work that out and I went to the library and got some books and how would a chief executive act and, and that's a load of rubbish quite frankly because they're not hiring this, uh, this nameless faceless chief executive, they're hiring you. So how do you build leadership and overcome a situation? You be yourself, be absolutely genuine, be transparent, be honest but be yourself. I've got no other advice other than that. I, I, I think that's, uh, that's absolutely right. Um, yeah, be who you are and try and you know, try and see how, how the way that you act impacts on other people and try and be self-aware and, and understand that. Look, look, the challenge I'd give you guys though is, and you will go into environments where there's a lack of leadership, Le you know, step, step in there and, and start providing it. Um, a number of times I hear people say there's no leadership in this group and I encourage everyone to do that. If there's a lack of leadership, then step in and start providing it um, and, and provide it. You know. Yeah, so I, I took this in a slightly different way, but if you're trying to build uh, leadership in a group, whether it's you or it's someone else, the first thing to help that is to be very clear on what the outcomes, the roles, responsibility, accountability of that leader or that group, so that everyone's very clear on what the vision is and what you're trying to achieve. I think that's really important. 
to, to help so that you can see when you're succeeding as much as anything else. Um, to imp you've got to have the empowerment, you've got to have the tools, you've got to have the authority to be able to do that. Again, whether it's yourself or you're asking someone else to, to lead the group. Uh, it's important to set people up to succeed and it's important to have the mentors that, that these are referred to. It's all about people, it's all about confidence, it's all about uh, knowledge of where you're going, but it is about having that support as well. Well, look, it, it, so it, for a start, it, it depends on, on why the team is demotivated for a start. Okay, so for, that's the first thing. You need to understand exactly what it is that, that's causing that. So let's say for argument's sake, we've been talking a little bit about the, the importance of leadership. If, say, for argument's sake, you've got an office in, I don't know, Wanganui, and you've got a demotivated team there, uh, if, if, if it comes down to that leader, then you need to take that leader aside and ensure that they have got the correct support structures in place and the correct training in place such that they can deal with that themselves. And then if they can't, then you need to support them. And quite frankly, if they can't do that, then you need to move them aside. So that's the, that, that's the first thing. Um, if the, uh, if the, the cause of the demotivation is more systemic across the organization, then I think, and it's not necessarily about, about local leadership, then I think it comes back to some of the comments I was making earlier. It comes back down to your own individual sense of purpose within that organization. Why am I here? What am I doing here? What's the point and where's this organization going? And they are four fairly large questions that can cause severe demotivation if you can't answer them. So it really is about using every mechanism possible to actually address those issues. But one of the first things, as I said earlier, it's actually about going in and having very upfront, honest, transparent conversations and listening. Mm. Listening to what they say, not promising that you're going to do everything to fix it, but listening and saying, I'll do my best. Simple as that. Uh, look, I, I agree entirely with that. Uh, that, that listening skill is, is something that um, I encourage uh, you to, to develop and, and learn the ability to listen and to inquire um, to, to find out what's going on and is, is asking about digging and you know why is that and, and why is that like that and, and so on. So you, you get a good understanding of it. Um, and the, the other part that, that um, David's also um, um, addressed there is um, having clarity about what it is you're trying to achieve and bring those two together. You know, one of the, one of the real um, demotivators that I have seen in, the, in parts of organizations or in organizations <coughs> is a lack of connect between uh, what the business says it's about, where it's going and how it's going to behave and what it actually does. And, uh, and there can be blockers on the way through there and trying to understand that what's actually causing that blockage and, um, and, and removing that. And that, that's a tremendous demotivator when people say to CEOs or to group leaders, um, this, I, I, I hear where you say we're going, I don't see any of that here. You talk about these values, I don't actually see that. Um, and trying to understand that disconnect and, and uh, address that, I think is uh, you know, really important to, to getting good motivation in there. Yeah, so I agree with all that. It, it is about understanding. It's about plenty of communication. It's about listening. It's about understanding what the issues are. There's, um, I wish I could tell you exactly. In the paper today, there's an article that Massey University have done some research to show what the primary causes of motiv uh, demotivation in uh, organizations is. And it's exactly what David said. It's generally it points down to one of the local leaders. So unless it's the systemic thing from the organization, but it is about understanding is it that, and if it is, what, what issues or uh, things that you need to help that leader to overcome? So, and it's just about lots of listening, uh, lots of trying, no false promises, just trying to work with the people to overcome those issues. Well, look, I mean, it's, it's fair, I, I guess it's a wee bit like, I mean, look at Colin Slade. A couple of years ago, Colin Slade was playing for the All Blacks. He didn't do particularly well. He had a couple of injuries, uh, and then he was sidelined. And it would have been very easy then for the team and for the coaches just to say, no, we've had enough of him. There's no way. We've got plenty of first fives here in New Zealand. 
but what they did is they probably took him aside, they had a chat to him, they put him in a training program, mm. they built him up both physically and mentally, and then he, they take him on the end of a, a the, the end of the season tour, and look what he does. And that's exactly the same in business. What do you do if someone isn't pulling your weight in your team? You have to address it and address it quickly. And that doesn't necessarily mean taking them aside, but it means having tough conversations with them. It means working out exactly what what it is that they need, um, working up a plan together with them, and then helping them and supporting them through that. But importantly, if you go through that process and they're still not pulling their weight, then I'm sorry, you need to make the tough decision and get, move them off the team. Because I can guarantee you, if you can see that they're not pulling their weight on the team, everybody else can see it as well. And if you don't do something about it as a leader, then you're going to lose credibility as a result. You know, um, something I've, I've observed through my career, I don't think anyone starts a job or comes to work in the morning not wanting to do, do a good job. And that's, a, that's where I start from. I think everyone wants to do a good job. Everyone wants to succeed. You know, we go out there excited with our first job when you start and either started now or about to start, you want to do the very best. So it's a good position to come from. So just reinforcing uh, uh, that again, you've got to assume that the person wants to do a good job. Uh, and you have to start, and I always start with, do they understand what the expectation is? Because sometimes it genuinely is, uh, they are falling short, but they've, <coughs> they've never had a clear expectation of what, what they're falling short of. So it's about making sure that they understand that. And then seeing quite often if they have been performing before, and so it's a, it's a change, it's something in their personal life which they may not even realize is now affecting their, their work or the project that you have them on. So it is about just asking. Quite often, if that happens, I just go into a room, like you say, and sit down and say, what's wrong? And the amount of times that people will then do an outpouring of what it is, and then you can look at if it's, if it's um, what sort of support or training or otherwise <coughs> that they need to get there. But if it does come down to a point that you need to move them into another role or off them, the organization completely do it quickly. So try that, but don't, yeah, don't leave them there because that will affect the morale of the whole team, the rest of the team. Okay, so there's lots of different change models out there. And uh, you, uh, I like to have uh, acronyms. I don't know about you guys, just to, to help me through a few things. And the change model that I like that works in your personal situation and in, and in your work situation, which just helps me to go through things no matter how small or how big the change in a logical order, it is called ADKAR. So it's A-D-K-A-R. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, anyone? No? All right, so um, A is about going through awareness. So it's about being aware of why you need the change. So when you're helping yourself or with others, it's about knowing why uh, that change is necessary and things. D is desire. It's in order to get anyone, including yourself, to change, there's got to be a, a, an element of desire in that. It's very hard to direct someone if they don't know what the change is about or and they don't have any desire to do it. Uh, K is about knowledge, so it's about any sort of training or a development that that person needs in order to do the change. Uh, and A is about ability because you can have all the knowledge, but if you don't have the ability to do it, it's still not going to work. And R is about reinforcement. It's about continually going through that. Now, that's uh, just a basic little model, but it helps in any change, anything from moving house uh, through to some of the complex problems that you, you take on at work. If you've got change, uh, I'd suggest you try that. It's a good model. Uh, it is a good model. And, and I guess the approach I take is, is some of the first part of that's understanding exactly what the issues are. And, and we talked about listening and, and other things before, but really getting your head around that. Uh, and then deciding what needs to be done. Uh, and we, we've talked about um, you know, uh, consultation with others, building a team around you who, who could um, who can, um, uh, you can bounce things off and, and get other views of it. Um, plan what you're going to do and, um, and communicate that plan. Build, look, you've got to build a critical mass. Hey, when you're making change in organizations, you've got to build critical mass around you. Um, one, one against, um, against uh, 3,000 or something is a bit of a hard task, I would imagine. Um, you, you've got to build that critical mass uh, and, and, then, and then get on and do it. You know? uh, get on and do it. <coughs> I've seen uh, plans, uh, change plans uh, falter because people have tried to get 100% right before they actually get on and yeah. implement it. And there's no such thing as 100% right. You just not look. 
you know, if, if, if it's a dramatic change you're trying to make, get on and do it and get 70% and then, and then you'll figure the rest out. Well, I mean, any fairly large organisation are fairly poor, I think, at, at implementing change. We're fantastic at coming up with plans, mm -hmm. but actually rolling out the change all the way through to the end, all the way through to the end, not 90%, not 80%, not 95%, to the end, I think we're particularly poor at. And one of the things that I've found that whenever you're doing change is about getting the context, to set the context right at the start. So you've got th three or four or five overarching points of why you need to make the change. And then whatever you're doing, everything is then tied back to there. So if you get a question from anybody, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? I don't understand why this is happening. Why is that happening? Because of that, because of that, because of that. And it provides the context. And by doing that, people can then understand why. And if people can understand why, you're most of the way there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the rest of the question was about, do you always use a one size fits all? Uh, you have, one thing you'll learn in any work environment, no matter how many people, you've just got to keep communicating. Uh, you've got to try as many different uh, techniques as possible because something that's, that works this month will uh, not get through the next month so I guess uh, <coughs> with especially with the 10 offices that I, I cover we just keep trying uh, different ways of communicating all the time we hit I was talking to some in the break we have you know face to face you can never replicate uh, face to face it's always best but we have a link system for those of you familiar with that we have a Yammer system we have an internal intranet which has all sorts of capability to communicate we try every means of, of communication um, to make sure that everybody is, is getting the message in the way that's, that um, most resonates with them. Exactly right. Uh, keep it simple uh, and clear. Don't, don't start getting the messages all convoluted. You know, here's, what, here's the message you want to get. Make sure it's a simple uh, message. Make, you know, if, if, you've, if, if you've got a strategy that your staff, your, your, your people can't tell you back what it is, then you have, you've sort of missed the mark, I think. Um, and so keep it really simple over and over and over again. Um, CEO, um, uh, past CEO at, at, um, at GHD uh, told me, uh, this is going back a few years, he said in GHD the way it works is we use all these different messages out there and we talk over and over and over again about this is the change we want to make and this is where we're going and suddenly someone will come back and tell you it was their idea, you got it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're dead right. I, I actually look at that question just slightly differently and again I agree with, with, with um, Tanya and Barry, but it's, it's the key point there is, is the different personalities and, well, to me and the way that I read that. And we, um, as I'm sure you guys have done as well, we did a, a bit of a, a culture survey and it's the old classic, what colour of hat do you wear? I'm sure you've done a similar thing and there's lots and lots of different things out there, but it's effectively a, a, a way of looking at what type of personality that you are. And we've got reds and yellows and blues and, and, and purples, okay? And I'm not going to bore you with what those are. But the vast majority of our, our organisation has gone through that course now, and it's an internal course. And then everybody just outside their desk has therefore got what colour they are most predominant in. You know, are they, are they are leading with red, or are they leading with yellow? And I was hugely sceptical and cynical about this, massively, especially when I looked at the cost, but let's not go there. But in terms, <laughs> in terms of your ability to then understand the different personality types, and then where possible, change the way that you engage with them has been unbelievably beneficial, unbelievably. Whereas before I might be having, it was like talking to an alien. Regardless of whether it's a face-to-face -face talk or over the phone or something, it's just like talking to someone from a different planet. You actually try and at least now understand where they are coming from, and I think that's incredibly important. So you need a bit of, you need a bit of research here to understand and accept the fact that people have got different motivations. And, don't, and one shoe certainly does not fit all. I th just, just I think there's uh, the, the fun, uh, just uh, d don't want to um, be honest, guys. Just communicate honestly. So just, just tell it straight. Tell how it is. Be honest. Okay, so uh, delegation sounds very straightforward, but some people never master it in their entire career. I'll be honest with you. And the way to, that I would suggest you start learning is what we've talked about today. It's about getting that core team of trusted people uh, around you and it's about finding one of those 
particularly that you trust to take on um, some tasks and that you can truly hand over and that you know will uh, get to an outcome that is satisfactory. One of the big things with delegation is you have to accept that it won't be done the way you would necessarily do it or in the time frame or to the standard that you would uh, necessarily want it to, but if it's done to the required standard in an acceptable time frame, you just have to be able to let that go. Thanks. I, I think I got it from the School of Hard Knocks. Uh, someone said to me once, um, uh, education is what you get when you read the fine print and experience is what you get when you don't. Um, my life tends to be heavier <laughs> on experience than education, I think. And, and uh, learning to delegate came through the experience side. Uh, and, and that was the realization that I couldn't do everything. And, and not only could I not do everything, there were a lot of people out there who were damn sight better at doing things than I was. And, and um, then you start thinking about, well, how do you play to individual strengths and how do you build a team around you that is a darn sight better than I am. Um, that I could ever do, and I guess that that's early on when it, you start developing your leadership. You know that you you come to that realization that um, a team um, is is outperforms an individual any day of the week, and realizing that. And for me, that was a bit slow. And um, uh, I shared with you the lesson as a 23 year old, 24 year old in Tonga. You know that was part of that process of learning uh, to delegate with your eyes open. You know. Um, Naivety is very, very dangerous, but delegating with your eyes open and, and um, having people you can trust around you. Well, I, I look at that question more, not, not so much in terms of, um, I guess, the way that you've, you've both perhaps answered it in terms of, of um, perhaps share, sharing work, but about sharing risk and accountability as well. And I mean, we have, uh, we have like all organisations, we have a number of delegation limits. Okay, so where, where you, you'll be a graduate, you'll be a senior graduate, you might uh, then be an office manager, you might be a project director, etc., etc., etc. So there's a bunch of different um, uh, uh, positions that you will go through in terms of your career progression. And as you work up the ladder, you will get different delegation limits. And that is one of the biggest single issues and opportunities that we've got in our company, without a shadow of a doubt. It's working within those delegation limits. And it's not necessarily working outside them, but it's getting people to work within them. That's the thing. They are there for a reason. They are there to basically say, you, Michael Jones, you are a senior project manager, and here is what you are able to do in terms of your delegation. Bang, 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 bang. We trust you to do that, and therefore you don't need to go and ask your boss, or the chief executive, or the general manager, it is entirely down to you. So I would say to you, if you have those delegation limits, for God's sake, act within them. Because otherwise, you just, you just make a mockery of the entire situation. How did I learn to delegate? Very, very simply. Again, through the School of Hard Knocks. And it's a silly little example, but I'll always remember this. And I went to an office when I was in the UK. I talked about earlier. And I went to the office, and there was a, a young graduate there. And I think it was an expense claim. Okay, It was an expense claim. And I was the UK director at that stage and the office manager wasn't there. And so this young graduate saw me coming in the door, and I'm, I guess I'm fairly approachable, and he came up and says, oh, can you sign off my expense claim? I said, yeah, yeah, that's fine, and signed this thing off. But in one fell swoop, what I did there was in effectively pull the rug out, pull the rug out from that office manager, because I took away his ability to delegate appropriately. So what I should have said then is, no, no, I'm not going to do that. That's not my job to do it. Your office manager can do that. And that's what I should have done. Now, it's a tiny example, but it's incredibly important that you, when, when you start in an organization, you will all have to work within delegation limits. And I implore you all to understand what they are and work within them. Look, uh, it's, it's probably the same tip for, for <coughs> everything. Uh. Uh, some years ago, we lived in Singapore, and, and I don't know if people have been through Singapore. Singapore's run as it's a fantastic place. It's run as a company. It's not a country. It's run as a company, Singapore Inc. And uh, when we were living there, they ran this whole program on uh, was the series in the newspaper that went on for a few weeks, uh, which was headed up. Um, I remember it um, failing to plan is planning to fail, and it sort of stuck with me. Plan your day, guys. Plan your time. Start with the big stuff. Start with the big stuff that's really important, and then. 
Uh, you know, I, I, there are times of the day for me when I'm not at my best. I, you know, after lunch is pretty of a low time for me usually, as it is probably for many people. And I, I tend to work around when I'm best uh, to do the big stuff that requires real effort, and then I'll, um, I'll do other things uh, and, and fit, fit it around that, that suits me as much as possible. That, that, that's not always possible because of you know, just, just things that are going there, but the, the best way to make best use of your time is to plan it. Plan your time. Plan your plan your, your, your month, plan the year ahead in, in case of you know the, uh, some, um, and then break it down until you have your day and use the, use the little bits to fill the holes in the day when you, when, when you need to. And that's, that's the only tip I can give you guys. Oh, uh, look, I'm not really sure I can add, add much more to that, to be honest. I think, I think Barry's right. You need, to, you need to plan, you need to do something that, that's, that's right for you. I mean, I, I personally, I personally get really, really uh, uh, well, stressed out a little bit, too, too, too strong. But I don't like it when I've got too many unread emails in my inbox. Because I have a, a, a personal goal that if someone, anybody, wants to send me an email, then I think there's nothing ruder than not responding or at least acknowledging that email at least within a day. So what I do every morning for the first hour, or for the first cup, well, for the first hour, is basically clear my inbox. Get it down to a level that I'm comfortable with, uh, with, with. and I come, I come in early to do that, and then I get on with the rest of the day. But really, that's just me. You need to do something. You need to plan. You, under, you need to understand how you work, and, and therefore how you work efficiently, and then stick to that. Yeah, and I've got nothing I can add to that. It is all about having a plan. I find the question really intriguing and, and, and this keeps on coming up over and over again about work-life balance and it implies that there's some separation from work and life <laughs> and, and, um, and, and that one's got me a bit bluffed I've got to tell you guys because work has been so integral in my life that I don't want to see the two separated. You know, work, work has given me many of the things that I've enjoyed most about my life. The opportunity to live in Beijing for two and a half years, you know, dear me. Um, and so I don't quite, I've got to, I hear this in a, and it's from a generation, you know, from you guys who, who are saying this, how do you get a work-life balance? Whereas I don't quite see that work and life for me are, are so integrally connected that, that uh, my friends, many of my friends come from, from work, you know, my social life comes from there, my own uh, aspirations. But I have life outside work and let's understand that. At the end of the day, fellas, you've got to make choices. And as your life moves along, things do change and the balance does move. You know, you start out as a, as a graduate engineer and you want to get ahead and, and our son is a graduate engineer. Um, he's a, not a civil engineer, he works for McConnell Dowell. He's up in the Pacific Islands, loves it. On a work-life balance, he's working uh, six days a week at the moment. He's doing about 70 hours a week. You'd say that uh, his, you know, some people would say his, his work-life balance is out of kilter. <coughs> He loves what he's doing, absolutely loves it. And Punga Punga about to go to Tuvalu. Um, you, your, your family comes along um, and you have to change it. And, and I've talked to people at work, I've seen their consistently 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, and I know they've got a young family. I actually think, I, I suspect there's something else going on in the background that maybe you know, work could be being used as an excuse, but, it, but I, uh, you know, I don't like to see that because I, I think family uh, changes. Um, for me, look, I made the decision um, a little while ago, hey, um, I have wanted to go sailing up to the Tonga for, for some time. Um, I've wanted, I want to do something else. I've, I've been to the top of an organisation. I couldn't get any higher than that. Um, I want to do something else. I made the decision uh, to do that. Um, I don't know what happens next. I'm not fussed about that. You need to make decisions in your life. and um, And those decisions will depend on what's going on in your life at that time. Yeah, I'll look at this slightly differently again. I mean, I, I think, see, I, I kind of reflect back when I came into this role four years ago, and my work-life balance, and I respect all the points you just made there, Barry, but mine was, was pretty poor. So I, I, I look at work-life balance as a differentiator between being at work and not being at work. And you can sometimes, the problem is you can sometimes be at work even when you're not at work. Does that make sense to anybody? And that's the problem. That's, that's where I believe when, when the work-life balance starts to get overloaded in one direction. And for the first six months of, of, that, of, of when I was in this role, I, I didn't do very well at that. So I'd work from 
7 o'clock in the morning, I'd probably got home at 6 o'clock at night, but really I wasn't really home. I wasn't home because I was spending all my time internalizing everything, reading emails. Every five minutes I would try and pick up the Blackberry or something to actually answer an email or pick up a report. And I've got three young kids and I realized something needed to change there. And I think it's incredibly, incredibly important while I recognize that work has created huge opportunities for myself as well to travel and, and the role that I'm doing just now and I, I, I'm eternally grateful for that. There has to be a point where you switch off completely and utterly and re-energize your batteries. You have to do that. And I don't know the answer. There's no magic bullet to that, but you must do that. You must put your phone down, your Blackberry down, whatever it is, and do whatever it takes for you to completely switch off. So what did I do? I certainly didn't play golf, okay? What do you do on a Saturday? I don't play golf. I love playing golf, but what I found I'd do is I'd go up and play golf on a Saturday, I'd hit the ball down, <laughs> down the fairway, I always said. Rarely it would go down the <laughs> fairway. And then in the time it took me to then go and find the ball, my mind would start switching back to work all the time. So that was no good for me. So what did I do? I learned sailing. That's exactly, we were talking about sailing earlier, and that's exactly why I do it, why I did it. I did something, A, because my son had learned sailing, but B, it was something I'd never done before. And now I go out sailing uh, dinghies on a Saturday, and I'm absolutely useless, absolutely useless. But I can tell you that every single moment that I'm on that yacht is singularly focused on keeping upright, right? <laughs> So any thought of work goes completely out the window and it's the most refreshing thing I've ever done. So that to me is incredible. Find whatever it is for you and make sure you do it. I'm gonna take a different take on this. I have uh, children that are six and three. So work-life balance or however you wanna reference that is, is extremely important to me. Now before I had children, I wish I knew how to, who to credit this to, I read in the Dominion Post of a woman who was a very successful woman and had an equally successful husband and they had three children and her advice was to get help. She said the most important thing was to have an understanding husband, a great assistant, a fantastic nanny, a great housekeeper and gardener, okay? And I follow that model. <laughs> and I'm so glad you're not talking to my wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, as I say, that, that is absolutely my advice. When you have young children, you want to be there for them. The time that you have away from work, you want to spend with them. You want to play with them. You want to be part of their growing up. You do not want to spend it doing gardening and, and housework and, and other things. You don't. You want to make sure that they're having the best as well. So that's my advice. Uh, part of it was how do you encourage your team? What we do for our team is we encourage that. We encourage people being able to work from home where that um, makes most sense, being able to do four day weeks when that makes most sense for them, whether it's a family commitment or a sporting commitment. Uh, it's about, as you say, finding something that you enjoy uh, and making time for that and making time to get uh, away and switched off from work as well. Talking, uh, talking through with people. Uh, it's about having that, uh, that group of confidence, the people in a work sense that you can talk to, that you can genuinely and openly uh, share issues and how you're feeling of the day and, and what you need to go through. Uh, it's also important to have those kind of relationships with your uh, significant other and your, the re your extended family and friends and things as well. Uh, it's, it's about um, playing with my children for me. It's about being able to completely switch off. That's my equivalent of yachting is just being able to completely uh, switch off. Uh, and it's also in the heat of the day, just knowing when to take time out. Even a simple walk around the block might be enough to just take the, uh, the stress out of that moment and get you back focused and having a clear mind again. Uh, for me, exercise. Um, uh, I like, like keeping a, a level of fitness. Um, uh, so that's one part. Uh, sailing, as you probably guessed, uh, interesting enough, I, I really enjoy heavy weather sailing. Um, a lot of people don't like it. I love heavy weather sailing because your world shrinks. You know, <laughs> there is, as you know, you know, there's uh, there's nothing more important than that length <coughs> at that time. There's nothing. Doesn't matter what's going on out there. I enjoy that because it does, um, you know, uh, clarify things. Uh, I've got to say, sleep is sleep is really important and um, learn learn to sleep well uh, for me um, I've become there's a link between stress 
and lack of sleep I find in me, and that goes through to lack of performance. So you know, even things like um, watching caffeine, all, all that kind of stuff, and getting to good routines. Uh, and, and family, um, family's been really important in our, our lives. My wife um, has had a, an extraordinarily busy career too, and we have our two kids. Um, and yeah, it's great about talking about. Uh, I, I remember um, when we early on after our first child came along, we were very stressed and. We end up buying a dishwasher. You got no idea the difference a dishwasher made to our lives. <laughs> <laughs> Coming home and finding us no no dishes in the sink, but but um, being aware of those things and, and um, yeah, just yeah, when I was talking about work life balance, work has been so important for me, but it's also provided the out of work uh, relaxation often as well, and, and uh, that ability to, to think about other things. Get involved with people, you know. Get involved with people um, is, is, is great. I enjoy that. Mm. Um, for me, it's just a continuation of the of what I said earlier. You, you need to I, well, I personally find that I need to find whatever means possible to completely and utterly switch off, switch off, because I think that's the only way that I can feel re-energized. And whether whether that switching off is over a lunchtime for going for a walk, whether it's going for a power nap down in your car, whether it's reading a book, whether it's um, sailing at, at the weekend, it's whatever you do to complete. Because stress, stress is all created. At work, stress is created because you're worrying about work. Assuming there's no, you've got no other family or personal issues, if it's stress-related work, then it's because you are worrying about work. Whether it's projects being delivered, whether it's the technical acumen of projects or whatever. So you need to do to, do, to reduce that stress, you need to stop thinking about work. So find a way to do that, to give yourself space and to re-energize your batteries in whatever way suits you. So in a consultancy, uh, the, the first and primary measure of success is financial. Uh, but after that, there are so many more. It's, it's around uh, great client feedback. It's around successful delivery of a bid or a, a project or a project win. There are so many things uh, that we measure success by personal goals, awards. Uh, you know, you know, uh, a lot of our people are studying at the same time, so it's achievement of those milestones. Uh, so there's a lot of measures of success and how we celebrate them is just whatever is appropriate. Uh, it goes from uh, a thank you to a spot bonus to a, a team breakfast or lunch or morning tea or, you know, again, it it's really um, comes down to the appropriateness of the situation. Not, not really uh, anything to uh, add to that. Um, just reinforcing a, a point that Tanya's made. Um, Look, the, the power of saying thank you and personally being acknowledged is, is incredible. And um, when I reflect back on my career and the times where I've felt um, like celebration for me at a personal level has been fantastic, actually hasn't been to do with getting a bonus. Don't misinterpret that, bonuses are nice, you know. Um, it hasn't been to do with anything big. It's actually been because my boss or someone senior in the organization has come along and said, Barry, I've heard about this. That's fantastic. You did a great job. That is really something special. And that probably for me, it might be different for other individuals, but for me personally, that's had the biggest um, impact. And I can remember many, many of those and, and uh, managers I've, I've reported to and I hold in the highest regard um, have in part got there because that's what they did for me. Look, I'm not really sure I can, I can add uh, very much to that. One, one little thing just on reflection, we, uh, again, as I'm sure your organization, organizations have done as well, we, we run a, something called a culture survey, which is a little bit, a little bit like a staff survey, but it's, it's uh, take, taking it one step further. And we did one a couple of years ago for head office or corporate office, the, the part of the business that I'm, that I'm in. And it, was, um, it wasn't particularly good. And what that did is it then gave us a platform to sit down in forums like this to actually understand from people, right, how do we make this a better, more vibrant working uh, environment for us all? And we had lots and lots of ideas. It sounds fairly simple, doesn't it? Really, it does sound simple. But we effectively did it. We did that, we, did, we made a whole load of change through and now roll forward a year and a half. We've done that culture survey again and it's just gone through the roof. But I don't really care about the actual results you can actually feel, you feel completely different coming into work in the morning now 
I can't say that strong enough. You feel completely different. It's almost like working for a different organisation. And that to me is, is certainly a real measure of success. Just a very small example, but very important. Uh, how do you embrace diversity? Well, we have uh, got a... <laughs> that's quite interesting. <laughs> Gee whiz. We've uh, just started a, got to be very careful what I say here actually, started up a women in leadership PIN, what we call PIN, which is a practice interest, pr practice interest network, which really just means it's a collection of people that can sign up to a, 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 an email group. And we, we started this thing up, and we normally do this with technical PINs, so we've got geotechnical PINs and structural engineer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we started up women in leadership, and it's just been like unpopping a cork. It's just been absolutely incredible. The amount of people that have signed up for this, not just females, probably, for, well, round about 45% of the people that signed up are actually male. Um, I think it's fair to say that the, the, the majority of people that, that submit posts are female. Um, but it has really just opened up the entire organization's eyes to, I think what we, what we always already knew, that it's incredibly important to, to promote diversity in the workplace. And by that, I'm not just talking about promote um, um, uh, females over males, it's, it's about diversity of thinking. How do we do it? Through many, many, many different ways that I'm sure these guys here will give a more articulate answer now for. Go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, um, uh, this, this is a big issue, fellas. Oh, this, yeah. This, this is a major. H how to address it? Look, you, you, you've got to encourage people. Um, uh, I've been of course, culture for me is something I'm fascinated by. Uh, I'm, I'm really, you know, something I've worked hard to do. It's a toughie, and it takes time. Uh, the next question uh, will probably address some of that. But, you know, how do, you, how do you do it at a small level? Look, one of the things I love doing, I, I try and I, I've tried to learn to say hello and a few a few things in, in as many languages as people have got in the in the in the company. And I try very hard to go around and say hello to them in their own language. It's great; gets a good response. They're at a low personal level but there are other things that need to be done to really attend to this and, and organisations got plans in place to make those changes and they're trying to implement them, it's a biggie. Mm. Yeah, so MWH as I said is a global organisation so we have uh, an American head office and this year they have taken, uh, we have always considered ourselves as an organisation that embraces diversity and you can see that through our management teams globally here in New Zealand. Uh, our New Zealand management team is uh, close to 50% female. So, uh, and of the general managers in New Zealand, there's four, two of them are, are female. So we do on a gender, but also on a ethnicity and uh, we try and keep, because we see a huge benefit to diversity in all our workforces, so we try and have always tried to keep diversity in every sense in all parts of our workforce. But this year we've put a spotlight on it. We have put our, our um, staff through uh, a number of uh, workshops and training and we're just about to start on another uh, training course just to make sure, and this one particularly is speaking to unconscious bias, it's in making sure that when you are employing people or you're promoting people, that everybody has a bias. It depends where you grew up, who you grew up with, what experiences you've had in your life, what cultures you've been part of. Uh, and it will, what it basically means is you will tend to favour people that are like yourself. So what we're doing at the moment in our whole workforce, and this goes for project teams right through to who you employ, is asking people to think about the biases and become more conscious of the biases they hold themselves and to look for ways to overcome that because all we're asking is that there is a level playing field for everybody. We're not asking for preference for any gender or any ethnicity or anything like that. We just want to know that in our workforce, every, everybody gets an equal chance, whatever the situation is. So, say something very dear to my heart. Um, I would say that's a very complex issue uh, and there are a lot, of, a lot of components but the biggest one is, is really obvious and it's what Barry and I were talking about is the numbers of women who have come through and who choose engineering as a profession. Uh, I don't know the exact statistics now, possibly one of you could, could say, but when I came through engineering uh, of, across the disciplines there was about 10%. It was just coincidence 
uh, there was about 10%, uh, you know, there was about 10% across the board because uh, chemical always attracted more and mechanolec attracted less women. And so, but when you, if you think about if there's about 10% of those that are starting in consultancies uh, that are women, by the time you know, through natural attrition all that. By the time it comes up to the candidates for a CEO position, there's quite often not a woman that's in contention. So that just the sheer numbers game is a big part of why there aren't so many women CEOs. And I think we, we talked a bit before mm -hmm. too, the, the comment Tony you made about like appointing like um, is, is an issue there as well. And not, not just women, but also culturally, that we tend to, um, tend to appoint people who are a bit like you, you know, and um, that's a that's a barrier <coughs> in the background as well, I think, and it's something to be very, very clear about um, when, when you're in that position of making appointments. Yeah, I, I think this. I, I don't know whether this question was framed to be slightly wider than, than engineering or not, but I mean, I'll just make a couple of comments. You obviously made the comment from within engineering. I think you can apply exactly the same thing right across many other industries as well, and and it's a real shame because certainly for, for the, 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 the female CEOs that, that I've been engaged with in the past, they, they bring a different level of thinking, a different level of engagement, which I'll be absolutely honest is, is way ahead than many other people that I've, many other CEOs that I've met before. Why? I don't know. I, I really don't know. It may be that as, as uh, females, they, they often face a choice, don't they? You know, going through life when they're starting to hit the straps of a what could be a very successful career, it often coincides with, with the, the times when they want to start a family as well. So how do, you, uh, how do we as, a, as a, an economy, how do we actually deal with that? Well, it, it, it's quite difficult. But I mean, I go along to uh, Business New Zealand, which is a, a, a group of most of the large businesses uh, here in New Zealand, as the name would suggest. And every uh, three or four months, we have a, a, a group a meeting of all the kind of major CEOs and you know, I've just been sitting here thinking about that, and I think I think of the twenty or thirty people that would come along to that, of which all of them are CEOs. I would say maybe three are female, three, and I think there's something wrong there, really do. So maybe you can tell us the answers. <laughs> <laughs> 